Okay, uh, let's go. Good afternoon, one minute afternoon. Uh, my name is Scott Nicholjohn. I've been working at the college for a while. Thank you for joining us. This is a talk that if you were coming to your reunion this year, would almost always have been held in a room upstairs at Farley Fieldhouse. Um, people would have had a good morning. Uh, Claudia would be uh, in that little uh, space up above the indoor track and the pool and uh, people would have had a great lunch and gone upstairs to hear a little bit about admissions and, and hang out a little bit. Uh, as you know, unfortunately, uh, we're not having reunion in person this year, but thanks for tuning in virtually. Before I introduce Claudia, just a couple logistical things. Uh, uh, we're, uh, we have closed captioning at the bottom of the screen if you have a need of that. There's a Q&A portion here and you're welcome to ask Claudia questions in a couple of different ways. You can use the raise hand function using the Zoom reactions down at the bottom of the screen and Claudia will call on you uh, or you can send Claudia a question through the Zoom chat function. And this is being recorded. So if something comes up, uh, family work, kids, and you wanna tune in later, um, this will be uh, recorded and offered on the reunion website. I am really excited to introduce Claudia today uh, for a whole lot of reasons. Claudia, in a few days, will become Bowdoin's new Senior Vice President and Dean of Admissions and Student Aid. Uh, Claudia and I had a chance to work together for a few years when uh, I was over at the other corner of campus, and she's been a fantastic presence in the admissions office since she arrived in 2010 and is going to do a spectacular job as Bowdoin's next dean. She's a 2006 graduate of the college of history and a minor in gov and legal studies. And the only uh, thing I'll add by way of introduction is you know, there's a lot of focus in the admissions and aid process on the selection. What happens after everyone applies and how does the class come together? It has been true for a while, and all that work is incredibly important. Um, it has been true for a while that the team puts a tremendous amount of work into how people who should know about Bowdoin, but may not, who are talented, but may come from backgrounds where uh, it's not so easy for them to know about the college, or maybe a place like Bowdoin looks like it would be, on, be beyond their reach or not affordable or not the right place for them in some way. And Claudia's commitment to this work, to making sure that the college holds its door as wide open as possible to all students, regardless of background, is just so impressive. And um, her heart is really, uh, really in this work. And uh, I know you all are going to have a great time getting to know her a little bit. So Claudia, I'll uh, turn it over to you. Thank you very much for doing this today and uh, meeting with us virtually. Thank you so much, Scott. And those were very kind words. And I have to always thank you for um, believing me and hiring me back in 2010 when I was looking at transitioning to Bowdoin. Um, but welcome to everyone. Um, I know that there is a big crowd who's joined us. So as Scott mentioned, um, you can ask questions directly to me. Um, or just put them in the chat um, if you want are okay with anyone seeing them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give um, some remarks, mainly just some reflections in ways that I've been talking about the college search in this last year, which I know for many of you, if you have a child who will be going through this, whether they're a senior or even younger in high school and are starting to figure out how to navigate um, searching for a college in a year that still feels um, like there are a lot of changes and a lot of um, questions to be answered by colleges. Hopefully some of the advice I give um, can be helpful and um, more than anything, I think, reduce some of the anxiety. Um, because more than anything, what we've learned in this last year in admissions and student aid, um, and this is true for my colleagues at a number of institutions across the US, um, is that the pandemic has given us an opportunity uh, to be even more personal, um, to really be empathetic in this process. And I think these are things that were always true at Bowdoin. Um, but it's been great to see other colleges um, really allowing students to take a breath um, and to really be students first and foremost in the process, 
and not just applicants. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ways that I encourage students to think about the college search, inevitably talking about financial aid and affordability and, you know, thinking about the ways that college should be a fit, not just for the student, but the family as well. Um, and then the application pieces and what has changed in this last year, what I'm anticipating will continue in the um, upcoming year, and then maybe get into some of the more um, newsworthy headlines and hot topics that um, I'm always seeing um, articles being written about. Um, so I, I will try to limit my remarks and not make this so Bowdoin specific, knowing that um, you know, there are more than 4,000 colleges in the US and um, colleges and universities. And I think as students really start to think about this process, um, it's about finding the right type of institutions rather than one dream school. Um, this is one of those things that I always, um, when I speak to students, I think it's natural for students to think about having a dream school in this one place that you're really aspiring to. But the reality is, and I say this all the time as an admissions person, is that if you, know, you fall in love with Bowdoin, it's very likely you're going to be able to fall in love with a couple of other institutions. And at the end of the day, students want to be able to have choices at the end of this process. Um, whenever we go through the entire um, application cycle. I know students are always sending information to admissions offices and waiting, but at the end of the day, they're the ones who have the final decision to make. Um, and that's where they want to be able to have choices and really feel empowered. But I think the other really important thing about the search process is that it isn't just about the end goal and the trophy, like the place that the student is going to attend. But I think if the student and the family really thinks about this process as one of self-reflection, um, and really thinking about um, how the student should be seeking out support and what they're aspiring to for their next home, that that actually also can help um, lighten the anxiety that students can feel um, as they're searching. So one thing is there are no good or bad schools. And I always say this up front. It's really what you make out of the experiences when you get to college um, that really positions students um, to be able to be successful. Um, and instead of thinking of this entire search process as just that end goal and finding the one perfect place, it's about self-reflection and realizing that every decision a student makes has trade-offs. So the first one that I always talk about, especially when talking about a small liberal arts college like Bowdoin, is about size. And if your student is in ninth, 10th, 11th grade, trying to really figure out what might make sense for them, this is one of those first questions that students um, tend to ask themselves. Um, and I think it's easy for students if they've attended a really small school. Um, my high school had about 120 graduating seniors. Um, I've had this moment where I realized I wanted something big. But the reality is any college is gonna likely feel larger than a high school experience for a student. Um, there aren't as many boundaries with class years as there are in high school. But size is definitely something to consider. And it means, you know, at a place like Bowdoin, that students can really bring their intellectual A game every single day to the classroom. There's, I always tell students, there's no back row that you can hide in when you're at a much smaller institution. And if you're comfortable sitting around a table with 10 classmates and a professor, then, you know, having the confidence in the classroom, that is something that a small college is really gonna instill in students. There are also gonna be days when a college student um, wants nothing but the back row. Um, and that's again, something that a much larger institution might provide. Lectures aren't necessarily better than seminars and vice versa, they're different. And that's, I think, one of those first trade-offs that students really need to do some soul searching in figuring out what kind of environment they think will be most conducive to their learning. If they want to be in a classroom where they're gonna be expected to ask questions, expected to have done the readings, to contribute to the learning, not just of themselves, but again, of the entire peer group, then that's where sometimes those smaller college experiences might be better. Um, and I always talk about my own experience too, where I was a really shy student in high school. I remember those moments where I would get really red if I knew that I had to raise my hand to um, ask a question or to interject a point, because I knew that participation was part of how I was being graded. And I knew that if I really wanted to learn, I needed to be in a much smaller place where yes, it was gonna to continue to be uncomfortable, but it wasn't going to be as traumatizing as trying to raise my hand and make a point in a classroom of 200 people. Um, so I think that's where I had that um, 
realization early on that I'm like, yeah, I get really nervous talking in front of my peers, but I want to be able to do that and trying to figure out what type of environment is going to be really supportive. That's, I think, where students need to start. The other big question, I'm originally from Los Angeles, and people always are marveled at the fact that I went to um, college in a small town in Maine. Um, and wondering again, if I ever miss the city life. And I think that's one of those other questions that students have to grapple with is, do they want the hustle and bustle of an urban institution and everything that might come with that? Um, and if they choose that, again, maybe they already live in a smaller town and are thinking about having that other experience for their collegiate um, time. That means that they may be sacrificing on some of the traditional campus space or the residential experience that a much smaller place in a smaller town, for those of you who are Bowdoin alums know well, um, that again, being connected not just to the institution and the people who work there, but really the surrounding town. That's a trade-off if you're thinking about a much larger um, institution. I, no hate to any colleges out there, but I spent a week um, on NYU's campus um, probably about four years ago doing a summer program with students. And we were traversing the city, getting from one academic building to the next, not quite knowing what was part of the university and what was part of the city. Again, it was busy. There was a lot to see and do. And the people that um, I was running into were uh, fascinating. But I also recognized that me as a 17-year-old, even coming from Los Angeles, um, having had a much more narrow experience in high school, that a much larger environment like that again, would have been more of a distraction for me as a student um, than really, again, being able to take advantage of all of the things that were out there. So I think, again, that soul um, searching and reflection on not even outgoing, but like what does a student really need in order to feel full in their experience and to feel like they're actually taking advantage of things? That's really where the small um, town experience versus the much larger city question comes into place. Um, and the other piece that I think I'm going to list a bunch of questions that I think are really important for students and their families to consider when they're starting to think about, you know, the big versus small question um, is really to think about the sense of belonging that a student wants to have in college. This has become much more of a conversation for not only admissions offices, but also student affairs offices, is that when students come to an institution, and especially one like Bowdoin, we want them to be able to explore, to take advantage of the entire life of the college and to feel like they have actually left a mark on the place um, and that they um, can navigate the buildings, navigate the experiences. Um, sometimes yes, feeling a little uncomfortable because I don't think college um, should be a place that's easy and um, a place where students breeze through. It should cause discomfort. But at the end of the day, do you feel like you have found your people? Do you feel like you actually are a part of this institution? So that's where I always tell students as you're starting to like figure out like things about yourself that you then want to see in colleges, it's to think about how you learn best, what kind of relationships a student wants um, to have, and what kinds of lessons they want to learn from their peers and their advisors. And it's not just again the classroom experience, how they envision living in a community, um, and what sort of diversity do they expect. I hope you'll notice that I did not ask any questions about things like what kind of majors are offered, um, what kind of um, study abroad experiences are there. In my eyes, I think the majors and the career tracks, they fall into place once the student has really started to feel fulfilled and are able to really explore different interests they have inside and outside of the classroom. Um, at a place like Bowdoin, students change their mind about their majors. They add on a minor or do a double major because they start to see those connections. And I think especially in this past year, we've seen how quickly things pivot um, and innovation um, takes place. And the careers of tomorrow really um, require people to have skills in a variety of um, areas and to think of careers not so linearly. Um, and that's why I actually do tell students like, fine, um, later on down the road, once you started to narrow down the list of the main things that are priorities for you, is to then start looking at what academic interests you might have and to make sure that the institution allows you and affords you the opportunity um, to explore a little bit. Um, but I think the initial questions are really more about the values 
and the ways that a student wants to learn and grow as a young person and not just again for the academic experience. Um, so the other piece that I wanted to mention really quickly too, um, when you're thinking about fit for your child um, is to, yes, there's the academic fit, the social fit, um, which I was really trying to hammer in on. The last piece is really the financial fit. And this is, I think, where parents in particular have a much more active role to take in the college search process. Um, you obviously want to be candid with your child to really um, make sure that they understand what might be affordable for the family. It's I, I've seen this happen a couple of times where a student has fallen in love with a particular institution, whether it's Bowdoin or some other place, and then they recognize that it's not feasible because of finances. Um, so you want to be able to start to have that conversation with your um, child. It can be a really uncomfortable one. Um, but what kind of savings plans um, do you have? What expectations do you have of your student and your child to contribute to their own education? Um, whether that's the form of you know, employment during college, if you do expect them to take out a few loans, um, regardless again of whether they're at Bowdoin or not, like what are the expectations of the family? What other resources do you have available to yourself? Are there tuition benefits um, that you might be able to take advantage of um, from your workplace? And I also think about, encourage families to think about the long-term. Do you have other children who are gonna be entering college or maybe this is your last one and in one year, um, they're gonna be the only one. The cost of your college experience is going to be look, um, look a little differently. Um, so really think about college, not just in that first year, but it is a much more longer term plan, especially as you're thinking of finances. Um, and the other piece is, I always say this, people spend so much time with admissions officers, they don't end up spending as much time with financial aid officers and they really should. Um, when we love um, talking to families and we love you know, our current students who end up working as tour guides and being connected to admissions officers, but the true relationship you're gonna have throughout your entire experience um, in the admissions and financial aid office is going to be with that financial aid officer. Um, at Bowdoin, um, all of our aid officers um, divide the alphabet. Um, so that's how they work with families. So whether you're a sophomore in high school right now and already asking questions, it's likely they're going to be the same person that's going to be working with you throughout your four years at Bowdoin. Um, so spend uh, just a fair amount of time um, asking questions of financial aid, using tools like the net price calculator and my intuition. Um, net price calculator is a tool um, that pretty much every college and university in the U.S. has available on their admissions and student aid websites. Um, you it goes through the module where it asks you about 20 questions. I always suggest that you have your most recent tax information with you. And for financial aid, um, as of a few years ago, it's actually a prior, prior year. So you would want your tax info from two years ago. If your child's gonna be a senior this upcoming year, you're gonna be looking at taxes from two years ago and that's what your financial aid is going to be based on. But you sit down with um, the net price calculator, fill out the questions as best as you can. I always advise families to save the results that come out at the end um, because you can actually um, email those to admission or not admissions offices, to the student aid offices to have a conversation about what those numbers meant and to really understand um, the questions that were being asked of you. Um, I have filled out the net price calculator trying to you know, pretend um, as if I had a child going through the process right now. And even for someone who works in admissions and aid, the questions are confusing. Um, so that's where I always tell families to take advantage of the fact that, you know, especially at Bowdoin, we're a people office. Even if your child isn't applying to Bowdoin, our financial aid officers um, will walk you through that process and make sure that, again, you can understand what your family situation um, looks like in the current year, um, and then what kind of information you might need to collect uh, for um, financial aid applications. I will say the net price calculator doesn't work as well if you are in a divorced situation or own a business. So that's really where talking and reaching out to financial aid offices is really important. Um, my intuition is a quicker calculator. Um, I think right now it's about 30 or so colleges that use it. Um, it's about seven or so questions. And again, it gives you an estimate of what your aid situation might be. Um, but like any calculator, it's only as good as the input um, that you are filling in. So 
um, ask questions um, either before or afterwards so that again, you can really support your student through the process. Um, so the next piece that I wanted to talk about, and I'm sure this is where a number of questions will really come up are, you know, how do you engage in a search right now? Um, what has changed in the admissions process? Um, at Bowdoin, we've actually been pretty virtual um, and actually not even pretty virtual, completely virtual for the last 15 months or so. Um, we're actually really excited that starting next Tuesday, we'll be able to have on-campus visitors again in a very limited capacity um, as we um, ramp up our operations again. But I've actually really thought that this past year of virtual experiences has been a bit of a silver lining in admissions. Um, it has made colleges have to be really creative about how we reach out to students, what we put out there. And I think more than anything, um, every college has created a ton of content. Um, and students are all at a different stage of their search when they're starting to look at colleges. There are students who, again, maybe as, you know, from ninth grade have identified a school that they're in love with, and maybe they're ready for a little bit more than what you know, the general um, campus visit provides. And I think the pandemic has actually allowed students to be able to research colleges um, in varying, at varying depths and levels um, based on where they are in the process. So I always advise that students um, start by looking at, obviously the college admissions websites, um, to look at what virtual opportunities are offered. And I think many colleges are now complementing experiences. Um, so as we ramp up um, to having visitors on campus, we're still going to be continuing <clears throat> all of our virtual offerings. Um, so we actually now have a recorded information session that gives you a broad overview of what boating can be like. That we kind of consider the intro. Once you've done that, then there's kind of this menu of sampling where a student might be able to um, do a Q&A with current students. Um, we did find through the pandemic um, that the student to student connection is the most pivotal in helping students figure out that sense of belonging and to really be able to um, see themselves in a campus experience. So I highly encourage families um, to take advantage of any of those student to student experiences. We also have um, Q and A's with admissions officers where we talk a little bit about the admissions process and then really get to Q and A. Again, recognizing that families are going to be coming into the search um, at different stages, we really want to make sure that when you're having that in-person connection with us, whether it's on campus or in the virtual space, that we can really get to what's on your mind. The other places where I think students really should spend a good amount of time on are on um, YouTube channels and Vimeo channels, um, Instagram feeds, uh, because that really starts to give you more of um, the sense of what is actually happening on campus. Um, with Bowdoin's YouTube, we have a number of lectures um, that have been put um, out into the virtual space, uh, moderated conversations, which give you a sense of what's actually happening on our campus. It allows for some candid conversations as well. Yes, they've been recorded, but the questions um, and our speakers really did take the time um, to answer as if they were speaking to a live student. Um, and then with social media, it really gives you a snapshot of what's happening in the day of and in the life of a current student. Um, so whether it's um, short tours, um, stopping and asking students in the library what they're up to today. Um, the other piece that I always encourage students to look at are college newspapers. They're gonna always be those moments of like, oh goodness, like what's happening on that college campus? but it gives you the sense of what students are talking about. What are some of those critical issues? Can they, um, are they seeing um, either issues or conversations that they really um, grapple with? Um, can they see themselves really participating in the conversations that are taking place? And that's, I think, one really good spot is to look at those college newspapers. They're, they pretty much all have online versions as well. Um, and then if you have the opportunity to visit um, a campus, um, in the flesh um, is to, again, take the time to really walk around campus and to stop people um, to have candid conversations. I always advise that yes, you do take the official admissions tour to learn a little bit more about the history of the place, but I think more specifically um, to be able to ask a different students questions. Yes, you can have the student who has been trained by an admissions office 
on how to answer difficult questions, but it's also, again, really important to um, see how generous um, students are with their own time in answering the questions of a random visitor who stops them. Um, and more than anything, too, is to walk around the community. Obviously, at Bowdoin, um, we always encourage folks to visit Brunswick in the surrounding areas because the environment, um, you know, Harpswell, uh, Freeport, Brunswick, Topsom, those all become a part of a student's college experience. And to be able to see what's offered beyond the campus walls, I think are really important in figuring out again, if you can find yourself being energized and um, being able to grow, not just by the institution itself, um, but everything that you're gonna encounter during your four years. Um, and with the application process itself, um, there are a few things that I think are not going to change very much, but if anything, it's more like pieces of advice that I give to students. Um, you all know that um, the main application that's used by most colleges is the Common App. Um, there's also the Coalition application. There will be some schools that have their own application. To be honest, at a place like Bowdoin, it does not matter which application a student uses, but it's again how they've used each part of the application to showcase themselves as a student and as a person. We're really looking um, in our process to make sure that we are, yes, setting students up for academic success, that they have the potential to really succeed in the classroom, but we're also really looking carefully at the community member we're getting. Every year we have about 500 incoming students. So each seat is precious. And we really wanna make sure that students understand what a Bowdoin education provides and not just the classroom experience, but again, all of those impromptu moments and the ones that I actually think end up shaping character the most, which are again, those interactions outside of the classroom. So in the application, the things that students can start doing now or start to think about even if they are a junior, one is to figure out um, how they're building relationships with teachers. Um, in the application, students are gonna be required to have um, generally about three um, letters of recommendation. One from a counselor who's assigned to them, usually based on alphabet, um, and then two teachers. At Bowdoin, we actually modified the application a bit this last year. So we had the counselor rec, a teacher recommendation, and then the third recommendation could really come from anyone whom the student identified as part of their community. Um, knowing that again, in the virtual learning space, it was harder for students to make connections with teachers. Um, there were some students in public schools um, where they were only having classes two days a week um, and every kind of hybrid in between that, um, that while we, yes, value the classroom experience, we also just really wanna know um, how a student interacts um, with those around them. So a student can start to think about how they're defining their own community, how they're um, taking advantage or really utilizing their advisors in their school community and again, in their larger world. Um, and when it comes to teacher recommendations, um, the rule of thumb here is teacher recs should be from the junior or senior year. Um, if the student has had a higher level course in advanced class, whether it's an AP or an IB or whatever their school um, notes as advanced, in say 10th grade, that is allowable. But again, we wanna see growth and we wanna see where a student is, um, how they think, how they contribute to their classrooms in the years that are most recent and those that are gonna be really the transition into college. Um, and the other piece too is the class where you earned the A sometimes is not the best class or the best teacher to ask a recommendation of. If a student has had to actually um, use study hours, um, study groups, really utilize the teacher to really have to rewrite papers or work through problem sets, that effort and that amount of growth, that actually leads to far more substantive letters of recommendation than one where the student was the natural in the class and was able to always have the right answer. Um, so again, think about the arc of the learning experience that a student has been through and how they wanna um, really tell that entire story and the trajectory they've been on. Um, the other two things that I'll mention really quickly, um, one of them are essays. You know, essays are a huge source of anxiety for students. They are an important part of the application, but you're hearing this from me, an essay does not um, automatically get a student into college and it is not what keeps students out. 
Again, it is part of a much larger review process, but the essays, at least at Bowdoin as well, allow us to look at the student through two lenses. One is the academic lens. Can they write to the level that we expect they're going to need to be at um, for a first year seminar on our campus? Can they um, think critically? Um, this feeds into, again, how we evaluate students academically, but what they tell us about themselves is just as important. Um, and this is where, again, character comes into play. What a student values, what has been meaningful to them, um, that's what we're really getting at. We want to try to understand the person that we're um, receiving on our campus. And um, for the essays, there are usually seven choices that a student has when they um, use the Common App. Those don't change very much from year to year. Um, so students can start to brainstorm, start to think about um, the things that have been meaningful to them. Um, and I think the other advice that I would say um, with essays is there's going to come the point where the student is done writing. Um, writing essays is a process, but you, there's only so much mincing of words um, that a student can do in their essay where um, finding that perfect phrase doesn't actually make a difference in how we review the application and what it tells us about the entire student. So I think there's, um, yes, students need to take time with writing their essay, to, trying to think about how they want to portray themselves, but they shouldn't necessarily um, rewrite and rewrite and wait until the application is due to turn in that final draft, um, because at that point, it's not going to necessarily make a difference. And they're more than anything um, preventing themselves from actually enjoying the other pieces of their senior year. Um, a couple of the changes that I've seen this year. Um, one, you'll, you might be actually um, seeing that some schools are asking for graded papers from students. Um, and part of this might be um, because of the test optional movement. Um, if you're a Bowdoin alum on here, you probably know Bowdoin um, has been test optional since 1969. And pretty much every college in the US um, went test optional this year. Um, there are a number of schools that have continued these pilots um, for another two or three years, others who have um, decided to go test optional um, moving forward. And there's others um, who might require a few other things from students. Graded papers is one example. Um, sometimes it'll be AP scores or IB exams, something else to complement the um, application. And this is where doing your research, being organized in how your child is searching for schools is going to be helpful um, because I think in the next two years, we're going to continue to see changes happening pretty rapidly, whether colleges decide to go back to test scores or implement other um, requirements. And then the last two pieces that I'll mention, one um, are early decision rounds. So part, again, about being organized and being thoughtful in the search process is to be um, not surprised um, by the time deadlines start to come up. At Bowdoin, we do have two rounds of early decision, both of which are binding. Um, so we have a November 15th deadline and a January 5th one this last year. Um, you will have some schools that have early action rounds, um, which are a form of early decision, but if they're admitted, um, the student doesn't have to commit. Um, so that gives students um, the ability to have you know, a, an admit offer if they're successful in that round, in their back pocket, takes a little bit of the pressure off. But I think more than anything, students need to, again, go into the search process and go into the application rounds, wanting to make a, a good match with the institution that they're going to be applying to, rather than trying to um, increase their chances of admission by applying early. At the end of the day, they're gonna be the ones attending that institution and they wanna make the right choice rather than one that's in haste. Um, so I always do tell students to take their time. At some places, early decision can be an advantage. Um, so that's where they want to ask those questions, want to um, be prepared if they are going to end up um, joining that early decision pool um, to receive whatever benefits might come from that. At a place like Bowdoin, um, we are fortunate that we get to be really selective and choosy in all of our rounds. Um, and I tell students that the advantage of applying early to a place like Bowdoin is more than anything, you're done with the process early, but it doesn't necessarily give you an edge in the way that we select students. We're gonna be using the same metrics and the same rubrics 
in our early decision rounds as we do in our regular decision. Um, and we're fortunate that, again, we get to pick students. Um, so we want to make sure that we're picking the right ones rather than just filling a class to fill it. Um, so take your time, but also ask those questions of admissions offices because you want to be prepared um, and understand if there might be an advantage. The other um, kind of newsworthy headline, and then I'll stop um, talking and see what kind of questions folks have, are really around demonstrated interest. You're going to hear this word come up a lot. Um, and that essentially means there are some colleges who will track um, how many times a student has opened up an email or what sort of contact they've had with the admissions office. Um, all of us now do use some pretty um, neat technology where we can see um, if students have received an email, if they've opened it, where on our websites they might be doing some research. And at some schools, that does help influence an admissions decision. At more selective institutions like Bowdoin, it doesn't. But where I think it's really important for students to still take advantage of um, online offerings, in-person offerings to check their email, is to make sure that they are understanding the institution and getting their questions answered. Um, I think it is becoming a little bit harder to just apply to a place on a whim and to feel like you actually know that institution to be, again, able to make a really um, conscious decision once that time comes around in the spring to say yes or no to a student. Um, so again, ask colleges if, it, if demonstrated interest is something that factors into decisions. Um, because that definitely um, came into play at a number of institutions this last year where there was so much uncertainty around yield and how students were going to pick schools that students who really did make the effort to um, engage in virtual offerings um, saw some successes at schools where that does um, factor in. So I'm going to end there. I know that there are a couple of questions that have been coming into the chat, so feel free to keep um, sending them directly to me. You can also raise your virtual blue hand um, and I can actually um, go ahead and call on you so you can ask your question live. Um, so as folks um, prepare to raise their hands, I'm gonna go in and read a couple of the questions that have come in. Um, so the first one was about this year being an outlier in terms of applications um, and especially with gap years and deferrals. Um, and if I believe that this is going to persist in the upcoming year. Um, and yes, um, the last year, um, last summer, we were very busy at Bowdoin um, taking calls from families and students who are weighing their options, wondering, again, what the on-campus experience was going to look like and whether it was worth it to start college um, this fall. Um, at Bowdoin, we were actually... Um, pretty surprised by the lower number of gap year requests that we received overall. In a typical year, we may have anywhere from 10 to 20 or so gap year requests. Last year, we were um, bracing for the worst. We were expecting to have close to 100 gap year requests. That's what we were seeing at a number of our peer schools. Um, and because of visa um, challenges that international students had, and just um, knowing that, again, the semester was not going to be the full first year experience, um, we did have about 36 students who ended up taking a gap year. This current year, from our incoming uh, first year class, um, that trend is much lower for us. Um, so today is actually the deadline for students to request a gap year. Um, and in total, we have seven requests. I think um, this year is going to be one of those lower um, gap year requests for colleges across the US. I think students have been um, in this stop and go this entire year. Um, they've been you know, confined um, to virtual learning, um, to being limited in the experiences they can have in their community that they wanna get out and start college. Um, so I think they're gonna be um, less gap year requests. There's also some uncertainty on whether some of the international experiences that students um, might pursue during gap years will actually be able to take place. Um, but I anticipate if I had a magic eight ball, um, that probably in two or three years, we go back to what was a bit more of a normal um, gap year experience. Um, so I think that will really be dependent on countries and borders, um, how vaccination rates um, continue to go, um, and then how students are experienced or deciding to embark on this next stage of their life. If they really do want to pause um, from, you know, the 
the churn that they've been in in high school, um, or if they're really ready um, to go into college and everything um, that college might have to offer them. Um, all right, let's see. So there was a question on whether um, Bowdoin has considered moving to early action um, and if we would make that switch. And that is not a conversation that has come up in any of our planning um, conversations with the board or with the president. Um, and I think this is more like personal um, opinion here is early action, yes, um, gives students some choice and some reassurance that they have an admission offer. Um, but it also continues to muddy the waters a bit, um, not only for admissions offices as they try to um, predict what yield might look like and how many seats they might actually have available, um, that for us, we wanna try to make the search as um, clear cut as possible, where early is an option, early decision is an option for students who know that yes, Bowdoin is the place that they would want to be at if they were admitted. Um, and if they're not ready to make that commitment, then they have a regular decision option. But I think choice overload um, can sometimes um, debilitate students a bit. Um, so early action is not a conversation that we've had at the college. Um, there's another question about testing. Um, so for this um, parent, their child has been homeschooled um, even before COVID. Um, so how would the application advice differ for a student um, who has been in a homeschool environment um, especially around testing. And what I always um, counsel homeschool families around is, again, you have more of an opportunity to tell us about the choices that have been made um, that have led to the schooling of your child. So what led to that factor in that decision? For some students and families, it is about proximity um, to educational institutions. For others, it's about values. How have you helped your child navigate their learning? Have they been in a homeschooled environment where you were the primary um, instructor? What kind of resources um, did you utilize? What were the lesson plans um, and the grading metrics that were used? If your child was homeschooled but took advantage of community college courses or other virtual learning opportunities, why did the student do that? How did it complement other lessons, um, both in the personal life, um, but also the experiences you were having in the home? Um, that really, again, gave your student the preparation to be successful on a college campus. And I think the other piece, especially for homeschooled applicants, is to really think broadly, again, around what community has meant and the contributions in a classroom experience or the intellectual contributions a student can make. Um, because again, you may not have a teacher that is writing on behalf of your child. Um, and I think that is really where um, the next st step is and perhaps um, the one that might be more difficult for a homeschooled student um, is to be able to really articulate their involvement in the community and how they see themselves now joining a community that is a little bit more on the traditional um, sense in a traditional campus with the expectations of um, having a classroom experience with peers. As far as testing goes, most colleges, again, especially with the uh, COVID year, have um, completely removed testing requirements um, for all students, even homeschooled students. Um, and that's where, because um, you may not have the same school profile or ability to see your child um, within the context of their peers, um, some schools will require um, or suggest that homeschooled applicants also submit um, a graded paper or a way for the admissions office to be able to see, engage the students' um, intellectual abilities and academic abilities um, in the work that they've completed. Um, so that would be a thing that I would recommend. Um, the other thing too is if your child feels comfortable, and this is true for any student, whether it's a homeschooled student or not, is um, to engage in a campus interview um, or an admissions interview is one, if one is offered by the institution. Um, because it allows a student to, again, speak to someone to share their thoughts and experiences for themselves. Um, to also learn about the community that they're going to be joining because inevitably that experience is going to be different for them having been homeschooled than having gone to, to, to a traditional um, high school experience. Um, let's see. Um, next question, there's one around, can a student walk onto a varsity um, team at Bowdoin if he or she has not been recruited? And the answer is yes. Um, and this tends to be the case at most um, Division three schools. 
where um, being recruited and having a conversation with coaches um, ahead of applying um, to the college is not the only way that students end up getting onto a team. Um, at Bowdoin, most teams um, do have um, tryouts that happen early on in the season. Um, and inevitably, um, they miss out on great talent outside um, before the admissions process. So they, at Bowdoin, do allow for um, tryouts and walk-ons to occur. Um, what I always suggest to students, even if they're not being recruited, if they think they're interested in athletics at the collegiate level, is to take the time to speak to current athletes to try to really understand what their student experience is going to be like. At Bowdoin and most small liberal arts colleges, um, the students are really student athletes and that student piece always comes first. Um, and yes, being an athlete is going to be a part of the college experience, but a lot of students who um, compete in athletics at Bowdoin um, are not gonna go on to the professional sporting um, world. Um, so it is again about teamwork and camaraderie um, the lessons that they've gained in their um, teams. Um, and yes, it is about competition and having another outlet for the, their social experiences, um, but the student piece is always first. If your child um, is trying to look at Division I athletics, um, that is probably a little bit harder for there to be a walk-on experience. Most of those seats are claimed um, on athletic teams pretty early on. Um, at some D1 schools, um, the recruiting starts as early as the sophomore year in high school. Um, so that's where, again, students want to be, act, you know, if sports and their athletic events are really um, a priority for them, to really have conversations with coaches, to really understand the coaching philosophy um, and the balance that the student is going to be expected to carry um, and their expectations. So have conversations early, but at Bowdoin, there are opportunities to be um, uh, walk on to a team. And the other question that I see in here is, while Bowdoin has been test optional, what percentage of applicants submit scores? Um, so that's a great question. Um, prior to the pandemic, um, usually about a third of our applicants were students who did not submit any testing. Um, and once we would get through um, May 1st and had our incoming class, about a third of the students who uh, enrolled at Bowdoin were students who did not submit testing. Um, we always, by the way, do collect testing from students who have it for research purposes and advising. Um, this last year, um, we saw those numbers tick up. Um, so in our incoming class, about 40% of the students are students who did not have testing at the time of their application. We know that some students, again, choose not to submit their testing as part of their application, and that's the choice they have. We don't wonder about their test scores. We don't, we're not guessing that they're bad, and that's why the student withheld them. Um, this year, we know that there were a lot of students who were unable to sit for any form of exams. Um, so again, it's about having choices for students. And we at Bowdoin know that a test score does not tell us everything about a student's ability or their potential to succeed in college they are going to have tests and exams at Bowdoin, but again, the learning that they do in the classroom, how they talk with their peers, the research that they do and conduct is far more indicative of their abilities than what an SAT score will tell us um, about how they're going to, again, navigate their academic experience. So great question. And again, it'll be interesting to see what happens next year. Um, I know there are a good number of schools, um, highly selective ones that have um, decided to be test optional um, for another two or three years. Um, but I think that test scores in particular are one of these things that unfortunately may go back to the way they were, where families um, will be anxious um, and will want to have test scores available for their child and may not be believers in the test optional movement or the way that um, admissions offices can actually review applications. Um, it's interesting to me that, again, my entire admissions career has been at Bowdoin, um, that I know no other way of being able to select students than looking at the entire application. Test scores um, are not talked about um, when we're making decisions. It's what students have valued, how they've contributed to their communities, how they write about things, how we see their intellectualism coming through. Those are the things that really matter to us. Um, that I really do hope uh, my peers at other institutions um, continue to see that there's more to a student than just a number. Um, but if it's any consolation to families, I tell them, go ahead, take the have your child take the test once 
and let it be. Um, you know, having the test score is not going to kill you. Um, if it's uh, some sort of reassurance, great. But the students should not spend their junior and senior year um, prepping for exams and you know signing up for as many SATs and ACTs to be able to increase their score by 20 or 30 points. That ends up making very little difference. Um, that they should actually be out and doing the things that they act, actually find joy in, um, rather than taking a test, um, or at least a standardized test. All right. So we have probably about another five minutes. So I haven't seen any hands being raised, um, but do remember that that's an option if anyone um, wants to go ahead and ask a question live. Otherwise, you can continue to um, send them in the chat. Um, there is a question that just came in around um, how legacy admissions might work at a place like Bowdoin. Um, does Bowdoin ever admit students who excel academically but are not a go-getter in terms of activities? So that second part of the question is one that I really um, always talk to students and families about. I think there's this myth in, in college admissions that the student has to have done everything to near perfection. They have to be a great student in the classroom and have done all of the activities, whether it's community service, athletics, leadership in a number of different clubs, perhaps even working as well. If the student wants to do all of those things, great. But when we're building a class, we're building a puzzle. Um, and we're looking for pieces that are going to fill that puzzle. We're not expecting that every student is going to be um, perfect at every single activity or that they are interested in all of these different um, ways that the college operates. Um, there are students who are, yes, very um, well-rounded and others who are pointy. Um, students who have identified an interest of theirs early in their high school who have pursued it um, to great depth and degree. There's room at a place like Bowdoin for both of those types of students and everyone in between. I think what is shared among Bowdoin students, um, yes, they're academically ambitious and they have um, are really thinking critically about how they want to grow as a young person. Um, but I think the other piece is they're looking to be busy. They're looking to explore um, and to find things that they are gonna eventually really find to be meaningful in their personal lives. Um, so whether that is a student who has devoted themselves already to community efforts and service, or the student who has been trying to figure out and sample, that's important. You're gonna find all those types of personalities on our campus. So do we have a preference? No. What we are looking for though, are students who are gonna be kind and generous and who are gonna, I always say, have this why not attitude. Why not give this a try? Why not push myself to try something new? Um, or to um, be okay with failure too, to know that you can be ambitious and things aren't always gonna work out, but it's better to have tried um, and to have realized that maybe that's not your forte and to move on to a different activity. Um, so we're looking for that balance in our entire student body and not just in the one individual student. And as far as legacy is um, concerned at Bowdoin, it's one of many other um, things that we look at in an application. So yes, um, whether a student's family um, or fam relative has gone to Bowdoin, it lets us know that they have an understanding of what this college experience can be like. But are we going to admit students simply because they have a connection to the college? No. We're again looking for students who are going to be able to um, be their own selves and really contribute to the entire life of the college. And that goes as well for our first generation college students, students from international backgrounds, they're not defined by this one um, thing, but it's really the collection of what they've done, what they hope to achieve in college, and how they've really thought about the experiences they've had. Um, so it, it's something we um, are aware of, but it's not going to be um, the tipping point or really the thing that um, sets a student apart. We're looking at the entire person. Um, all right. So... I've gotten my two minute warning. So last call for any questions. I'm seeing a few more on the ED um, versus regular decision. Um, and for Bowdoin, um, because we have two rounds of early decision, um, we admit about half of our class through our two rounds. And I know for some families they're like, oh my God, that's a lot of students who are getting um, into the college and seats that are being taken. Um, taken um, through the early rounds. And I think, again, early 
decision at Bowdoin is a really self-select pool of students. There are students who've identified um, that Bowdoin truly is a place that they see themselves succeeding at and that they want to be at. Um, and we're also going to be reacting in that same way. We're not going to necessarily say no to a student just because um, we're being cognizant of how many seats um, are going to be left in regular decision. We're not going to turn up, um, turn away amazing students just for fear of a number, but we're not lowering our admissions bar. Um, again, students who are admitted in early decisions are students who are going to be excited to take um, and who are, we're going to be really um, excited for everything that they're going to contribute to the college. Um, and with our regular decision um, admitting, we admit far more students in regular. Um, and we're also fortunate that students um, do end up accepting our offer of admission in high numbers. Um, so there's all sorts of calculus that goes into um, how yield works and um, how we're calculating how many seats might be available. But the biggest thing here is, yes, about half of our students are students who apply through an early round, um, but it is not an advantage in that, that it has become an easier way for students to get in. There's students um, who, we sometimes will defer and we end up taking in our regular round because after seeing a full semester's worth of um, either grades or seeing them in the larger context of the pool, we then recognize, yep, they are definitely a student we want to have on campus. Um, and the other thing to note about early decision at Bowdoin too is we do deny students. If um, we recognize that a student is just not going to be successful in the admissions process at Bowdoin, we don't want to string a student along. Um, we want them to be able to move ahead with their college search and to really be able to get excited about other places. Um, so for us, we do admit students, we defer students, and we also deny students. We know that that is really hard news for a student to hear, especially if it's their first call, the first application they're submitting and it's a denial. Um, Yes, it's hard, but ultimately it's the right thing to do for a student rather than um, have, stringing them along. Um, so I'm gonna end there. I'm over my two minute warning and I'm gonna call Scott back onto the screen to see if he has any closing remarks. Just thank you, Claudia. Thank you for uh, spending the time today. Thank you all for joining. If you're in a class that would have had a reunion this coming weekend, there's a lot more happening. And even if you're not, uh, there's a lot more happening online over the next few days and weeks. Uh, you should have gotten a Beyond the Gates calendar, I think, today uh, with an update on everything that we're offering. So thank you for being part of this one. Uh, thanks again for soon to be Dean, uh, Claudia, for spending the time. And uh, Every time we have one of these, I think we wind up by saying uh, we look forward to doing this all in person as soon as we can. Uh, we've made a lot out of Zoom, but it will be great to get the Bowdoin community together, whether we're in your neighborhood or you're back here in Brunswick. So thanks very much. Stay well until that time. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.